Himalaya Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, have you ever considered that being sad could actually be a good thing? Or do you avoid that emotion at all costs? Well, my guest today is going to help us understand what sadness is good for and how to transform pain and vulnerability into strength. She's the best-selling author of Quiet, the Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, a book that is seven years on the New York Times bestseller list. Also, her TED Talk, The Power of Introverts, has gotten over 40 million views on YouTube. Her brand new book, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, is the number one New York Times bestseller as well. And it aims to help readers embrace sadness and understand that it can actually be a superpower. Susan, all the way from New Jersey, a very big welcome to Real Health. How's it going? It is going great. It's so nice to be here with you, Carl. It's great to have you. My God, some serious numbers. So people are obviously fascinated by what you do and what you talk about and what you write. Uh, The new book, uh, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, The idea for the book, where did it come from? Let's start there. Well, it started with my lifelong fascination with sad minor key music. Um, Like I'm obsessed with Leonard Cohen. I've loved him (laughs) from the minute I first heard his music. And um, and there was this moment that happened when I was a I was a, a law student. I was in law school and in my 20s and some friends came by my dorm to pick me up on the way to class. And when they got there, I was like blasting Leonard Cohen from my stereo speakers. And and they were kind of, they, they were laughing. They were like, why are you listening to this funeral music? And at the time I thought it was kind of funny and I laughed and we went to class and that was the end of the story. Except that I could not stop thinking about this for the next 25 years. like. It, just what it was about that music that was so absorbing and what it was in our culture that made it a suitable subject for a joke. And, um, and that's really the question that got me on this quest to figure out like what, what the bittersweet, what what the bittersweet is in life. Um, And I, you know, I, I went and I talked to neuroscientists and to film directors and like explored wisdom traditions from all over the world and literary traditions and so on and found we we live there is this state that i call bittersweetness um which is a kind of intense awareness of the way in which joy and sorrow are always paired and the fact that everyone and everything we love best will not be here forever but that what comes from that knowledge is a deep sense of the beauty of the world and um, it's a kind of gateway to creativity and to connection and transcendence and we're living in a culture that doesn't teach us this because everything is supposed to be so relentlessly cheerful and positive all the time that um that we've lost access to these deeper states of meaning okay so it's almost a contentment with the world that we live in or the or the or the, the time that we live in uh by by addressing that the the you know the the, the, the sorrow and longing they they create that sense of contentment in life and contentment in what we do. Yeah, or it's more of like an I I don't even know if I would say contentment because it, it, it's more like looking at the world in a clear eyed way you know in in a way that admits um, the joyful part of it also the the sorrowful part of it you know that isn't going to look away from that um, but that finds in that mix. Uh, something transcendent and also a, a, a real source of creativity and a source of human connection. Tell me a bit more about the quiz, the bittersweet quiz that you developed. Yeah, so the quiz is at the very beginning of the book and it's a quiz that measures your proneness to this state that we call bittersweetness. And um, and I'll give you some of the questions from the quiz and then I'll tell you kind of what it means. So some of the questions are, do you react intensely to music, art, or nature? Um, do you like sad songs? Do you like sad music? And then another one would be, do you get goosebumps several times a day? And, uh, oh, and another one would be, um, have other people called you an old soul? So I don't know how you react. Do, do you tend to answer yes to questions I'm like that? I'm thinking through no? as you ask like, them. Some of them, I, do, do I like yeah. sad music? Absolutely, yes. Do I react strongly to art? Yeah, I would go with that. Uh, 
with the old soul thing? Yes, I would go with that too. Okay, yeah, I've answered three yeses. That's a, that's a good thing, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you what it means. I mean, what we found is that people who score high in this quiz, they also tend to score high um, in a psychological trait that the psychologist Elaine Aaron calls high sensitivity. And it means kind of that you're a person who reacts intensely to everything that life has to offer, you know, like the good and the bad. I'd go um, with that. So, w <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> right. That's like, right. We, we, we've never met before, but you've, you've nailed me in the space of three minutes. But yeah, okay. Oh my gosh, I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then also people who score high on this quiz tend to score high on a, a state called absorption, which predicts creativity and high in states of um, like proneness to states of awe and wonder and spirituality. So that's some of what goes along with this. And um, there is, I should say, there's also a mild correlation between scoring high in this quiz and anxiety and depression, which doesn't actually surprise me because I think that the state of bittersweetness is probably like if you imagine um, if you imagine a spectrum with let's say clinical depression on one end of the spectrum I think bittersweetness is probably like somewhere in the middle of that spectrum you know it, it's a place where you can see both the joy and the dark whereas whereas um, depression is more of like you know you've kind of fallen into the emotional black hole and into a place of despair uh, bittersweetness is is a place where you're in touch with that but but it but you're you're maintaining a balance that allows you to um to kind of dig in into these these, these states of, of wonder and creativity and not uh, fall into the despair side of things so i think they're kind of cousins of each other without being the same thing chat to me about sadness then and, and we'll, we'll further the chat about that about the importance of it uh and about you know and we've already touched on it briefly about what it's good for but let, let's kind of take that a little bit further so you know because people tend to certainly in ireland anyway steer away from sadness or you know it, it's just something that isn't it's not particularly talked about people shy away from it and just chatting to someone saying well actually you know it is important it can be it can be a good thing Ch chat to me a little bit more about that sure i mean so no one wants to feel sad i don't want to feel sad you don't want to feel sad it's not that sadness is in any way like it's not to say sadness is a pleasant state you didn't realize it was pleasant but it really is Th that's not the thing um it is it's rather that sadness is an inevitable part of human life and in so being it also happens to be a way that connects us to each other um, because we're we are actually evolutionarily designed to respond to each other's sadness and to bond in that way um, and this is because we're we're designed to be able to take care of vulnerable babies who signal what they need from us with their tears um, and so because of that we've developed all these mechanisms that respond to to the vulnerability or to the sadness of other beings so it's an incredible bonding agent um, it's also a great source of our creativity you know there's a way in which um, what we do with creativity is we we take pain and we make a decision to turn it into something else into something beautiful and the reason that we go and we look for art and music and this kind of thing is because what what an artist or a musician or a writer is doing is they're basically they're taking everyday experiences that do involve some degree of of sorrow and pain that you normally can't talk about so well at the grocery store or with your colleagues at work you're not going to like come in and chat about that stuff so like what art is doing is it's taking those experiences for you and it's saying i have i i the artist i have felt them too um, I know what this is and not only have I felt it and not only am I going to tell you that I felt it but I'm going to express that emotion in a kind of elevated and aesthetic state so I'm going to kind of like give it back to you and let you know that we're all in this together and I'm going to do that in an especially beautiful way like that that's part of why we're drawn to go to a concert it's like the concert is is expressing all of this for us in ways that we can't express ourselves um, and, and that's why concerts can feel like such a religious experience because it's like it's making sense of 
as a, a kind of of the common everyday yearnings and pains and sufferings that are not socially acceptable to talk about, and it turn it elevates them. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Lay Healthcare. We are chatting. A really interesting chat today. This is it's it's fascinating so far. It's quite chilled out. It was quite mellow, but that's quite lovely. Uh, what, what I was going to say to you there was, and you kind of touched on it with the concert thing, right? People associate with uh, musicians, with songwriters, uh, because of the experiences that they write about in the songs. And so, so what you're saying is that by artists being aware and, and being, you know, being being open to the sadness component of it, they create something very powerful, something very strong such as a song or a hit and a lot of the hit songs that we really associate with are, are feelings that we have gone through but we can't express it and the artist who who, who has gone through it can express it better than we can and that's so basically what, that's very much what you're saying isn't it yes and i'm saying also that um i mean that we love our happy songs we love our dance music right like that that's amazing um but there's something about the sad music that um like we, we know from studies that it's sad music that gives people chills and goosebumps. Like happy music doesn't do that. It's the sad music that does it. Um, and people will say that they listen to uh, the, the happy songs on their playlists like 175 times, but the sad songs 800 times. So, and, and, and they'll tell researchers that they, that with the sad music, they feel connected to a sense of, of the sublime and of higher aspects of life. So, so this is what I'm saying. There's like this, there's this, um, there's this deeper dimension of life that we all seek access to. And that one of the best ways to get there is through being able to engage with the, this side of our emotional life that we normally kept hidden. Chat to me about leaders then. So uh, you write in the book about leaders and the emotions that they show. So traditionally, leaders are very strong. They may be angry to a point. Uh, but, you know, I suppose what you're really saying is they should be embrace their emotions and express that more because leaders check generally don't. Yeah, this is an interesting um, aspect of, of management research. So like researchers study the different emotions that leaders display and then how, how, how the people who they're leading feel about them based on those emotions. And what we know is that when leaders display sort of more angry emotions, they're seen as having a certain kind of power that's called positional power, um, where uh, it's kind of like the power to hire and fire people, you know, the, the, the power to control the fate of others. It's that kind of power. Um, when leaders are willing to express sorrow about something that's happened, let's say, at their company or whatever it is, um, that's seen as a, a more relational power. And what, what people will say about those kinds of leaders is that they feel like they're on their side and that they're, they're kind of in it together. Um, and it, it's, not so much, it's, it's not so much a hierarchical relationship to the leader, it's more like you could call it a team relationship where everybody is um, pulling in the same direction. So these different emotions are, are useful at different times and for different circumstances. Um, it's not to say a leader should be all sad or all angry for that matter. It's, it's to say that we tend to think that there's a unidimensional way of projecting power when in fact there's, much, there's a much broader range that would be appropriate. And chat to you about society then, and society, and and I suppose culture's view on on sadness. Do you think that they avoid it? Do you think that we're kind of almost conditioned to avoiding it, or is it something that's becoming that there's a greater awareness of uh, on a societal level? Oh, we're definitely conditioned to avoid it. I mean, to 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 quite an extreme degree, really. We we live in an extremely um, you know, it's become a cliche in the last couple of years, the idea of toxic positivity. And we do live in a society that doesn't want us to be talking about these kinds of things. It, it makes us uncomfortable. Um, I think there is a there's a real fear that if you're too willing to talk about this aspect of one's emotional life, that 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 you could go off the deep end you know that you could start to wallow in it and never come out never be able to it would be like a kind of quicksand and you can never come out of it um i 
that that fear is not justified, but it is a real fear. And I, I trace the historical roots of where this comes from. And what it really is, is that around the 19th century, when when Western culture be started to become extremely focused on, on business and on the question of who is succeeding and who is failing at business, increasingly the, um, the, the question became, if you succeeded or failed, was that because of good or bad luck? Or was that because of something inside you that had caused you to succeed or fail? And increasingly the answer became, it was something inside you that you were somehow a winner or you were somehow a loser. And the more we started to think of ourselves and each other as winners or losers, the more we wanted to avoid anything having to do with the emotions associated with loss. You know, the last thing we'd want to do is, is be vulnerable or talk about sorrow or talk about longing or anything like that, because that was like, that was too much on the loser side of the ledger. And we became very, very afraid of that side of human experience. Can I ask you, what would you say to people listening in who exactly like that or are, are, are afraid of showing their vulnerable side, who are afraid of discussing emotion with people or expressing emotion with people or who are afraid to potentially, you know, look back at, at sad times in their life and prefer just, I suppose, just to the, the classic thing of, you know, putting it in the, putting it there and not really addressing it or looking at it. What, what do you say to them? I would say that it, it doesn't really work. Um, that even if you want to do that, it doesn't work because it has to go someplace. And we basically have a choice. And we, we have a choice with the, with the painful things that happen to us or with the feelings of longing that we might have. Um, and one choice is to bury them. But then inevitably, you're going to end up taking it out on yourself or on other people around you. But then the other choice is to acknowledge it and just see it as part of a whole life, you know, that a life involves light and dark, and that's, that's what a life is. Um, and that's when you start having the, the freedom, the emotional freedom to take your pains and turn them into something else and, you know, like turn in the, in the direction of, of meaning and of beauty. So just for example, like in the wake of 9-11 of in, in this country, in the U.S., you saw record numbers of people applying for jobs as firefighters and teachers. And now in the wake of the pandemic, we're seeing record numbers of people applying for, for medical school and nursing school. And, and this is what, this is kind of like on a grand scale, people taking a painful situation and turning in the direction of meaning with it. And this is something that, that humans are set up to do. We, we just like instinctively want to make this conversion of pain into meaning or pain into beauty. So there's no reason not to lean into it. It's, it. it's part of our birthright. And do you think that people, you know, often attach the, 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 the search in, in meaning that they attach it to the wrong things, such as their salary or their car or, you know, the material stuff that they think that's going to bring the happiness that they seek and the, the rewards that they seek. And by not, you know, by, by not looking at, by not going down the route of, of, I suppose, soul searching for want of a better word, that, uh, the salary is going to bring the happiness and the car is going to bring the happiness. And generally, I suppose the truth is that it doesn't bring the happiness because they're, they're external and extrinsic. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would say they don't bring it. Like, I, I don't want to be unrealistic about it. I, I, I do think that um, you know, sort of being able to support yourself and being able to have a nice car or whatever it is, that brings a kind of pleasure. It brings comfort. Um, it brings a certain... Uh, freedom from certain stresses, all, all these kinds of things that are real. Um, it's just that what, what they don't also bring is meaning and depth, which is, which is what makes a life truly worth, um, you know, well lived. So I, I would just say they're separate dimensions. It's, it's, it's not that you need to have either or it's that there's space for both. And of course, that you know that 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 search for for depth and for for, for meaning is why we're see, you're seeing that push in the U.S. of people looking, you know, in terms of the medical profession, firefighters after nine eleven. It's that sense of that, you know, it, the ability to be able to to respond and to help, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we see the big push after COVID and after the likes of nine eleven as well. 
Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think people want to respond to, um, yeah, they want they want to respond to whatever the, the the troubles that happen to present themselves in their lives. They they want to respond with something that's in the direction of meaning. And and what also happens there there's this fascinating research by um, this psychologist at Stanford. Her name is Laura Karstensen, Stanford University. And she has discovered that older people tend to be happier than younger people. Um, and she's looking at quite older people. Um, they tend to have a greater sense of meaning. They're like a um, much greater sense of gratitude. They're much less prone to anger and to bad moods. And she has found that the reason for that, like at first she couldn't figure out how, why this would be so, um, but she was able to identify that the reason is that older people have a greater sense of life's fragility. And this is just because they know that they don't have that many days left. Um, so they're more aware of, of, of fragility. But she's also found that younger people have this exact same profile that older people do, the same emotionally happy profile, um, if they also find themselves in conditions where they're aware of life's fragility. So like younger people in situations of political upheaval and this kind of thing. Um, there's something about the awareness of the fragility that turns people in this direction of like of, of an incredibly satisfying meaning. What, and, one of the things I, I often and ask... I, and I guess what I'm saying is it, there are ways to get there without having to be 80 years old or in the middle <laughs> of political turmoil. <laughs> that would be the, t that would be the yeah, ideal. Yeah, it, it, it's the awareness factor. <laughs> one of the things I often ask guests when they come on the show is that... Uh, what would the, the top three things you would like people to take from 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 the show or from the episode in terms of the small kind of takeaways that people from, who are listening in can take from this can take from the chat and say okay ideally I'd like you to do this this and this after listening to the chat what would and it's a it's a tough question actually more often than not but what would your your top three takeaways be? Yeah, I mean, I guess the first thing I would say, and this comes from the letters that have come pouring in from the book, is uh, to know that. I mean, the, the letters that I'm getting from people are, are saying, oh, my gosh, you know, I felt these things all my life, but I could never articulate them. And even if I could, I didn't want to say them out loud because, you know, it just is so like against the grain of what our culture would tell us. So first of all, to know not only are you not alone, but you're an incredibly good company of artists and philosophers and um, theologians have been thinking and writing about this for 2000 years across the globe. So you're part of a, a very story, long and storied tradition, number one. Um, number two, I would say whatever pain you personally can't get rid of, take that and make it your creative offering. And I don't mean by creative offering that you have to like hang a painting on a gallery wall. You know, it, it could be baking a cake or, or um, you know, planting a flower or whatever it is for you. It can be a small gesture but take your pain and try to turn it into something else. And then the final thing I would say is turn proactively in the direction of beauty in general. Um, I would say start your day every morning by engaging proactively with something you find beautiful, whether it's music or um, going out into your backyard for a moment, uh, under the trees, listening to the wind, whatever it is, that has a way of really orienting you in this direction. I stand on the grass barefoot with a cup of tea every morning. That's my thing. Do you? I do. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> and I live out my back garden. And uh, yeah, I'm a, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm, bare, I'm a barefoot person. I, I hate socks and shoes. But that, that's how I kick off my morning every day. It's out in the back garden, cup of tea in hand and bare feet on the grass. And there's just something very kind of earthing about it. It kind of settles me before, before the day kicks off. But however, there we go. There's my random thing. Uh, Susan, if people want to... Can I just ask, how, like... One minute, 10 minutes? Uh, I could be there for a good five minutes, ha very happily. Yeah, uh -huh. myself and the birds just hanging yeah. out. Uh, yeah, my wife oh thinks my I'm, God, I'm I love it. Cracked, I love but, it. I think I'm, <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's awesome. I'm going to think of that. Well, yeah. it's before the busyness of the day kicks off. Uh, I tend to I tend to chase my tail quite a bit. So it just calms me down and just sets me up for the day quite nicely before the, the mayhem of the day ensues. If people want to uh, follow you on Instagram, where can they follow you? Yes, so I am on Instagram. I think it's Susan Kane author, and I'm on Twitter at Susan Kane. I'm on Facebook. I think that's author Susan Kane, and LinkedIn as well. 
And I would also encourage you to come to my website, which is susankane.net, and there you can sign up for a newsletter. And I also have this bittersweet course you can take where you can sign up and get text messages and audio messages from me every day sent to your phone every morning. Very cool. And of course, Bittersweet has sorrow and longing. Make us whole is out in all good bookstores and online now. Susan Kane, thank you so much for joining us today, folks. That's it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, we are back next week. And you know where to find us at Carl Henry PT on Instagram and Real Health at Independent.ie. We'll see you next week for more Real Health. Slow and go full. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.